the accessory pathway. If you have an accessory pathway, then there is another way for the ventricle to be excited, to be pre-excited before it's excited by the AV node. Okay, so that's what pre-excited means. And you can see that by evidence of a delta wave on the ECG. All right, so seeing that delta wave on the ECG tells you that there is evidence of ventricular pre-excitation. And that means that we're dealing with an accessory pathway. All right, uh, that's what all the terminology, what they mean. And if you have pre-excitation, delta wave, and a tachycardia because of that, that is when we say you have Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So technically, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is someone with delta wave and pre-excitation and tachycardia. Because sometimes people can have accessory pathways and pre-excitation without tachycardia. Not all of these wires, these accessory pathways, support the tachycardia, all right? But anyway, these are how the terminologies, what they mean and how they relate to each other. Um, often, if you can say, if you see this and you call it wolf parkinson white, people will still understand. You. But I just wanted to clarify technically what they actually mean, these terms. Is that clear so far? Any questions? I don't think there's any questions. Okay, that's fine. Right. So, uh, next slide, please. So, in fact, what we were seeing earlier, remember we saw this SVT earlier. In fact, what we're dealing with here is an orthodromic AVRT. So AVRT stands for atrial ventricular, sorry, let me say it again, atrial ventricular reentrant tachycardia. So that's atrial ventricular reentrant tachycardia. That means the atrium and the ventricle are both involved in a circuit that goes round and round. And we say it's orthodromic because it's coming, it, the ventricle is activated in a normal way as you would with the with the electrical activation going down the AV node. So the electrical activation is going down the AV node, down the his picture system, giving you a nice narrow QRS complex during tachycardia. And this is orthodromic AVRT, a tachycardia that is associated with the presence of an accessory pathway. And so therefore, when we terminated the tachycardia in this patient with a vagal maneuver, what you saw was delta wave, was pre-excitation. Is that clear? Any questions on this? Okay, I talk slower. All right. I, I, I will try to talk even slower. I'm sorry, but I'm mindful. Sometimes I do speak rather fast. I will go slower still. Okay. I will go through this one more time in a slow fashion. This is an SVT, and we call this particular SVT orthodromic AVRT. Okay, it just means that the atrium and the ventricle are both involved with a circuit going around involving the accessory pathway. It's called orthodromic because the ventricle is activated in the same direction as it normally would down the node and the Hispaginchi system, giving you a narrow QRS complex. All you need to know is that these sort of tachycardia can happen when someone has a delta wave on their ECG. Not, not everyone may have a tachycardia, but when you see... Uh, a delta wave, this could potentially happen, all right? And this is the patient that we saw when you gave, when you did a vagal maneuver, you saw that there was a uh, delta wave on the ECG. Okay, so I hope that's um, clear enough. So shall we move on to the next slide, please? So the first two examples we've seen, the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and the um, AV, sorry, the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, and the AVRT with the accessory pathway, both of these are what we call nodal dependent tachycardias, okay? So both of, in both these cases, the tachycardia terminated with vagal maneuver. Obviously, you can also give adenosine. We haven't mentioned that, but you can also give adenosine. Okay, next question. Uh, next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right. So I'm going to give you, again, another minute to look at this. Another ECG, this is a different patient. Um, what does this show? 
Can anyone uh, give me some answers? I'm still waiting. So, uh, okay, someone has put down regular tacky. Very good. Again, what I'm showing you, remember we're talking about similar ECGs. Okay, very good. Someone's put down sinus tachycardia. What if we take one step back and describe it more generically, like I've told you to, and just give me an um, umbrella. I want an umbrella diagnosis. Umbrella. What is the category this is under? We've been talking about it. No, what is the umbrella category? OK, some people say they can't see P waves. Some people have put down regular fast rhythm and some people have put down sinus tachycardia. Someone has put down AF. Let's go through the ECG. Right. So I would describe this as a regular, narrow, complex tachycardia. It's regular. It's narrow. The curious complexes are narrow. It's a tachycardia. It's a regular, narrow, complex tachycardia, what we've been talking about so far. So again, this is a kind of SVT again, right? Now, in this particular patient, I'm going to show you another of these ECGs. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Can we move on to the next slide, please? That's great. So. This patient, we have we happen to find another ECG in the past. Uh, can we go back one slide, please? Can we go back one slide, please? Great. So this patient happened to have a different ECG, and we've we've un, we've seen one of his old ECGs. Okay. Right. So what does this ECG show? Okay. When someone said not clear, is it because they cannot see the ECG clearly? Is that what they mean? Let me have a look. Uh, it looks pretty clear to me, I think. Um, anyway, all right. ECG is too small to see. Okay. Uh, George, do you mind? Uh, I don't know. Can you enlarge it a bit or something? I tell you what, don't worry. Let's move on to the next slide because I have enlarged V1 here for your, for your, for your, uh, okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is an uh, enlarged V1, just one, one, one particular segment of it, okay? If you look on the, so on the left side is the initial ECG I showed you. On the right side is the second ECG I showed you. They are the same patient. OK, in fact, what this shows is a kind of atrial tachycardia, or you might even know it as atrial flutter. Um, and just put that, just go. Can you move on the slide, please, George? And what I put down, the red arrows where I put down are where the P waves are. Can you see that there is a run of P waves? It's regular, but it's fast. A run of P waves going through the, the trace. Right. When you see that, you can call it, some people want to call it atrial flutter, that's fine. It's a kind of atrial flutter, or you want to call it atrial tachycardia. Atrial flutter is a very specific kind of atrial tachycardia. So it's probably more accurate to call this an atrial tachycardia. But if you are more comfortable with that terminology, that's fine. But this is what we're dealing with. Now that you've seen this, I'm going to go back now. George, can you go back and just show them, just go back two slides now. And one more, back one. Now, I hope you can see that this is, in fact, a kind of atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter. And you can see three to one conduction. Can you see three? Look at V1. There are three P waves before a QRS complex. Three P waves before a QRS complex. This is not AF. 
because it's you can see a very clear P wave. You can see this is in fact a regular rhythm. It's not AF. It's an atrial tachycardia or an atrial flutter, if you want to call it that. Okay. So this is three to one conduction. And and George, go back one now, please. Uh, George, can you go back one, please? Okay. And here you get two to one conduction. But the reason why you can't see the other P wave is because it's buried inside the QRS complex. Okay. So, so in fact, now, if we can move forward now, George, two slides. And then one more slide. Yeah, I hope you can appreciate all we're seeing is that there is an underlying atrial tachycardia. OK, and all we're seeing is variable AV conduction. On the left, there is, you know, you have two to one conduction. On the right, you have three to one conduction. OK, so that's the difference um, between between the two, basically. All right, so next slide. So what I wanted to show you was atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter, if you're more comfortable with that term. But atrial tachycardia is, in fact, an umbrella term, which also includes atrial flutter. So atrial tachycardia is also a cause for a regular narrow complex tachycardia. It's also a cause for an SVT. OK, but different to the previous two tachycardias, if you give a, if you do vagal maneuvers, so if you give adenosine, Typically, it does not terminate the tachycardia. It just slows down the AV conduction. So that's the difference mainly with atrial tachycardia. So next slide, please. So the learning points really from this whole series of cases is that we've talked about regular, regular narrow complex tachycardias. We've talked about supraventricular tachycardias. And in fact, the ECG shows regular narrow complex tachycardia. The mechanism for this is supraventricular tachycardia. And you have either these three categories, these three mechanisms that can give you that. AVNRT, junctional, which is junctional reentry, AVRT with a pathway, or atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter. Okay. So those are the three main class. Uh, and then you can try and work it out by seeing whether it's nodal dependent. If it's nodal dependent, it tends to be that there's a circuit involved. So it could either be AVNRT or AVRT. And how do you treat the patients? Well, um, this is what we're talking about here is the, the final sentence I put down is more for longer term treatment. OK, I'll come back to this in a minute, but just go forward one slide, George. Uh, just go forward one more slide. OK, come back one slide. I haven't got the slide here, actually, but I might have it later on. Um, come back one slide again. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I can hear someone talking there. Can you mute yourself? Please? Thank you. Uh, so what I put down, monitor medications, catheter regulation, mm -hmm. that is more to do with uh, longer term management. In the acute management of these tachycardias, uh, you can look it up. There are algorithms for this. I think I have a slide later on that I will show you, Okay, but I'm just going to briefly mention it now so that it's clear in your mind. If someone presents acutely and they are you know, with a tachycardia, an SVT, like this regular narrow complex tachycardia, and they are well, uh, then what you can do in effect to start with is a vagal maneuver. Or if that doesn't work, you could give adenosine. OK, so this will, will it will either terminate the tachycardia, like, for example, the first two examples that we have here, or in the, in the, if it's an atrial tachycardia, what you will see is you, it will unmask the, the atrial tachycardia. We will see more of the P waves. So either way, giving, doing a vagal maneuver or doing, giving adenosine as a first step is very useful. And then what you then do once you stop the tachycardia or once you come to a diagnosis as to which one it is, AVNRT, AVRT, or AT, uh, you can then decide what you're going to do. If it's in a &E and the patient's relatively well uh, and don't have that much symptoms, you could just monitor the patient and refer to a specialist like myself, and we can talk about long-term treatment. Medications, the typical one that you've come across, obviously, would be beta blockers, a very common medications, which is very reasonable as a first line choice if you are not a specialist. Catheter ablation, a more specific treatment where we actually put wires to the heart and treat inside, burn off the area that's causing the tachycardia. This is clearly a very specialist treatment. Um, I would say that anyone that you see with parasol SVT, 
with this sort of SVT that you see on this, these traces. By and large, it's useful for them to be referred to see a specialist because we can talk to them, talk to them about the full range of long-term management, including catheter ablation, which um, in some people with very troublesome symptoms is a very effective treatment. Okay. Let's see if there's anything. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide now. This is, if you're interested to learn more about SVTs, um, you may read this. It's a 2019 ESC guidance for the management of patients with SVT. Okay, it gives you a lot more information about what I've gone through with you today, and uh, it's very, it's a, it's really a very useful read. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, good. I'm going to give you now a minute to look at the ECG. What does this ECG show? Okay, I think most of you've got it. It's irregular and there are no P waves. So if there's irregular, yes, good. The first answer's come in. Uh, it's in fact, yes, it's a, it's a regularly irregular rhythm with no, with no obvious P wave, right? I mean, there are some fibrillatory waves, but they're not like the previous one. It's not like a fixed shape. The shape changes all the time. It's like this sort of like, you know, it's not fixed in shape, right? It's changing all the time. It's fibrillatory waves, not P waves. So this is AF. It's regularly regular, and there are no distinct P waves. All you see is fibrillatory waves. So this is AF. Okay, I hope that's clear. All right, I wanted to bring this out because AF is probably going to be the most common tachyarrhythmia that you're going to see. Okay, and you should recognize this when you, when you see it. All right, next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, so there is a lot to learn about AF. And if I were to talk to you about AF, it will take the whole hour, if not longer. This is mainly an ECG talk, so I don't want to go too much into, the, into AF, but I want to point out to you where you can read more about AF. The European Society of Cardiology has come out with the most recent updated guidance on uh, how to assess, diagnose, and manage AF in the 2020 guidelines. I strongly recommend that you read this. Uh, it's very readable, and they have lots of summary, like summary diagrams that you, can, that you can look at. Next slide, please. This is from the older guideline, not the more recent one, but I just wanted to kind of give, but it, I, I'm still using it because it, it gives you quite a nice idea, an overview of the priorities of three treatment. And you can see really, um, Initially, you might acutely rate control or rhythm control, depending on the clinical presentation. You might want to address the lifestyle factors, but one very important thing is about stroke prevention. So you've got to always, in patients with a significant chas vas score, so that's a way of risk stratifying their stroke risk in AF, you have to think about anticoagulation fairly early on, okay? A lot of the kind of longer term rhythm management or catheter ablation treatment, those are all kind of further down the line, as you can see. They're not really that much of a priority at the beginning. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So that's all I'm going to say about AF, all right? Um, I just wanted to show you the ECG and highlight some documents for you to read. Let's move on to a different series of cases now, all right? Different series of cases, all right? So now we have a 78-year-old man with a previous anterior MI, presents with acute breathlessness. Okay, next slide, please. Patient is cool and clammy. Patient is hypotensive. Patient is tachycardic. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the ECG. I'll give you a minute to tell me what it shows. <laughs> 
So this one is coming very quickly. The answers are coming very quickly. I think most of you got it. Um, you all mentioned ventricular. Some put tachycardia, some put fibrillation. Okay. This is ventricular tachycardia. Okay. It's not fibrillation because ventricular fibrillation, uh, you don't see, you, you don't see these sort of very distinct QRS complexes. Okay. Ventricular fibrillation, you just see it, it, it's all over the place. The axis is all different, beat to beat. Everything just looks different. Uh, it, it, you don't see a very kind of, or, this is an organized rhythm. Okay, it's an organized rhythm. You can see very clear QRS complexes. It's, but it's fast, okay? So in fact, what I would call this, taking a step back, on the ECG, I would call this a regular, and it's regular, because if you measure the R interval, it's pretty much fixed, regular. Broad complex, it's broad because the QRS complex is broad. Tachycardia, because it's fast. So we're dealing here now with a regular broad complex tachycardia, a regular broad complex tachycardia, okay? And there are a number of features on this ECG which makes it ventricular tachycardia, okay? And we'll go through that in a minute. But yes, when you see a regular broad complex tachycardia, the first thing that should come to your mind is ventricular tachycardia, and most of you have got this wrong. So the patient is there in front of you, clammy, hypotensive, unwell. How do you treat this patient? Okay, some answers are coming through. Very good. So uh, already two answers. Okay, All right. Hmm. Yes. So you would. Someone's put down coarctation of aorta. I'm not sure what that means, but yes, cardioversion. Yes, you would cardiovert this patient electrically, right? Not just any cardioversion, DC cardioversion, right? That's the treatment for this patient um, because the patient clearly is compromised. In someone with a tachycardia causing hemodynamic compromise, the treatment is using electricity to cardiovert the patient. Okay, very good. Next slide, please. Okay, go back one slide. Okay, Have a, so this, we just said, we, we've basically said that this is a regular broad complex tachycardia, and I've said that there are some features here which makes this ventricular tachycardia, okay? Now I'm going to give you, so just go next slide now. So these are the features on an ECG which would be very suggestive of ventricular tachycardia, okay? Have a read through this, then tell me in a minute, have a read through this. I'll give you a minute. Okay, not quite a minute, but I think uh, just 15, 15 more seconds. Have a read through this. So these are just things which are which would give more of a clue that what you're dealing with is VT, ventricular technical. Now that's more or less a minute. Now I'm going to go back to the last slide now. So tell me. Are there any of those features you've seen in the pre in that slide I just showed you? Can you see any of those features? If you can, put them down on the text box now and see if you can get, see if you can give me some features. What what are the features on this ECG which might suggest that this is indeed VT? There are some things on this ECG that it, what that was on that list. Can you can you name any? I'll give you a minute. Okay, yeah, very broad. It's very broad. That's true. I give you that. If it looks very, very, very broad, that, that is the sign of VT. Very good. Are there any other specific things that you can see here? So some of you have mentioned extra systole. I think what you mean is there are two beats, or rather three beats that you can see, which look a bit narrower, right? So if you look at lead two at the bottom, if you look at lead two at the bottom, the rhythm strip, you can see that there is a regular broad complex rhythm but there are three beats there which are narrower. Can you see there are three beats which are narrower? 
what are those beads? Are they extra systole? What kind of extra systole they are? But what are they? They're not really extra systole, but what, what, what are they? Yes, VA dissociation, independent P waves. Very good. We're talking about capture beats and fusion beats, right? I mean, some of you mentioned independent, so VA dissociation, independent P waves. When you see a fusion beat or a capture beat, and we'll go through what, what the two differences are in a minute, what they mean is in a run of a broad complex rhythm, you see beats which are narrower. In a run of a broad complex rhythm, as you see here, you see beats which are narrower, which happens. They come, but they do not interrupt the tachycardia. So the tachycardia still runs through. Okay. So what this in fact is, is that there is the, the V, the ventricle. Let me just, can you see my hands? The ventricles at the bottom, VT is going fast. And then obviously in most cases, there's VA, in, in this case, there's VA dissociation. So the atrium is doing its own thing while the bottom is going fast. The atrium is doing its own thing. And occasionally you have a beat that is captured by this atrial beat. Okay. And you see, and you see, this is either a capture beat. So a capture beat is a narrow beat which looks identical to a sinus beat. A fused, a fused beat is a beat which is in between a sinus beat and a, and a tachycardia beat. That's a fused beat. Okay. But what in fact all you're seeing for all you're looking for is a narrow beat in a run of tachycardia. Okay. And when you see that, it is a sign that there is VA dissociation uh, of independent P wave activity. Okay. And it this proves that it's essentially you're dealing with a ventricular tachycardia, basically. All right. Uh, also, a few other things on this ECG. The axis is very bizarre. If you look, ABR is positive. It's a what's called a northwest axis. It's pointing this way up, up the right northwest. If you imagine, north, south, east, west, northwest. Is, you know, you don't really get heart cardiac axis pointing that way. So the electrical activation is very abnormal. Okay. A very bizarre frontal axis, a northwest axis. It's very, very broad. Okay. And there is, uh, uh, we can see capture and fusion. So these are all the evidence on the ECG that we're dealing with the ventricular tachycardia. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, again, can someone mute themselves, please? Uh, I think uh, someone has unmuted themselves. Uh, okay. Can we? Yes, yeah, good. All right, next next slide, please. Okay, so ventricle tachycardia. So you have a focus in the ventricle, which is causing the tachycardia. All right, next slide, please. All right, so I've got a different patient now. This is a different patient. Okay, um, what does this, uh, the patient, uh, let's say the patient is in a &E, but very well, sitting there talking to you, looking at you. Okay, very well. Um, but this is the ECG. What does the ECG show? What does it show? I give you uh, a minute. Okay, some answers are coming through. A regular broad complex tachy, very good. Oh, yes, regular broad complex tachy, yes. Regular. Okay, so I think you guys are getting the theme here now, all right? So you've, a lot of you put down regular broad complex tachy. Some of you have put down VT. Right, let me give you a, let me show you. So it so happens on um, this patient, we have an old ECG. Uh, just next slide, please. And this happens to be, be the patient's ECG. You can't see the P wave very clearly, but there is a, there is a small P wave in front of the QRS complex. This is the patient's ECG in sinus rhythm. Okay, there is a P wave, it's just not very showing very clearly. So this is the patient's ECG in sinus rhythm. Okay, next, next, next. Okay. So I'm going to put them side by side. Left side is sinus rhythm, right side is tachycardia. Okay, side by side. So what are we thinking? What is, what, what do we think is causing the, what is the most likely cause of this broad complex tachycardia? Is it VT? Do we think it's VT? Or not? I'll give you 30 seconds for this. I mean, you either know it or you don't really. So you've got the you've got the you've got the baseline ECG on the left and tachycardia ECG on the right. Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. I'm going to give you a clue. The QRS complex looks identical in sinus rhythm as in the tachycardia. Absolutely identical. Absolutely identical between sinus rhythm and tachycardia. Okay, let me go back one step. Okay, if you look at the sinus rhythm ECG, 
What would you call that if it's inside the rhythm? It is inside the rhythm. What would you call that? That appearance. So if I go back one, uh, do you mind just go back one ECG? So this ECG in sinus rhythm, what does that, how does that appear? How would you describe that appearance? It's broad, but what, what sort of, have you guys heard about bundle branch block before? Yes, left bundle branch block. Yeah, that, that is left bundle branch block, right? That is left bundle branch block. Now, if the tachycardia ECG is pretty, is identical to the sinus ECG, then what you most likely dealing with, especially if the patient is very well, sitting there looking at you normal, you know, um, then it's most likely going to be, next, next slide, you're dealing with SVT with aberrancy or SVT with bundle branch block. Have you, have you heard of this before? So you have pre-existing left bundle branch block and sinus rhythm, and then you have an SVT, whatever that is, let's say even sinus tachycardia, let's say. I'm, I'm not saying this is, I'm just saying give an example. Uh, you could have whatever reason um, and whatever type of SVT, and we've gone through all the examples previously, you effectively just have the bundle branch block pattern, but faster, right? So this is another common reason why you might come across someone with a broad complex tachycardia, but clearly you need to look at the other clues, right? Uh, baseline ECG is useful. Uh, some people have bundle branch block only in the context of tachycardia, so that, some, that will make it a little bit more tricky. But in cases where you already have a pre-existing ECG and the ECG looks exactly identical, then that's a very big clue then. Is this clear? Someone said no. I don't know what that means. SS, what do you mean by no? I, I don't know. Uh, I hope it's clear. Uh, I could take questions at the end, I think. Let's wrap. So this is what we mean by SVT with aberrancy. So there is already pre-existing left on the branch block, and you're just getting a tachycardia with the same kind of so an SVT, but with the kind of same kind of bundle branch block morphology, giving you a broad complex tachycardia. Right, next next slide, please. Okay. Right. So I have another ECG here. What does this show? Another different patient. A uh, different patient. Uh, but I just want to show you the ECG again. The same kind of theme here. Okay. All right. Okay. Maybe take a step back before you get to V. It's not VF. It's not VF. It's not torsad either because it's regular. It's not twisting. Okay. VT. Yeah. I, I, I can see why people are calling this VT. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Um, how would you describe it before you say it's VT? What is the umbrella term? What is the description of the ECG? It's a regular broad complex tachycardia, right? Okay. Um, now, I can see why some of you think of VT, because it's very broad, it's very, very broad. It doesn't look like any kind of bundle, typical bundle branch pattern, right? So yes, I can see why you think this is VT. But what if, let's say the patient was cardioverted, and let me show you this ECG now. Next one, please. Next slide. Okay. This is the patient's ECG. What does this ECG show? Have we seen this ECG before? Again, I open the floor. Yes, delta wave. Yes, the same ECG we saw earlier. Remember we saw uh, this, say, actually it is indeed the same patient in fact. Uh, so what's happening? Why are we seeing a broad complex tachycardia in the same patient with delta wave, with wool punks and white? What is happening? Well, I'll tell you what's happening. Next slide, please. So this is the, on the left is the patient in sinus rhythm, on the right is the patient in a, another different type of tachycardia, broad complex tachycardia in this case. Next slide, please. So in patients with pre-excitation, with accessory pathway, with wolf parkinson white syndrome, you can have also what's called antidromic AVRT. This is different from orthodromic AVRT, okay? In what way is it different? Well, the direction of the circuit is different. In this case, the ventricle is activated by the accessory pathway. Can you see the arrow? The, the, the arrowhead is different. It's, it's flipped from the, from the previous uh, orthodromic AVRT. Uh, 
In antidromic AVRT, the ventricle is activated by the accessory pathway. And then the node, the hispicinchy system, is just the retrograde. It, it goes back up the atrium via the, the node in the hispicinchy system. Okay, so it's antidromic because it's the opposite direction. And in this case, you will get a broad complex tachycardia because we haven't really talked about this, but I think it's worth just pausing right now and talking about it right now. If you think about it, the reason why the QRS complex is narrow in the first place. Is because of septal activation. So if you have ventricle, so we're talking about the left and the right ventricle, if you have the ventricle being activated from the middle, so septal activation, then you have you will have an, a, a narrow QRS complex if it's coming from the middle. Okay. Because the time you know you're using his package system, the time it takes for the ventricles to both sides to activate is short. So you get a narrow QRS complex. Middle midline septal activation gives you a narrow QRS complex. If you don't have that midline activation, the activation is coming either from the right or the left side, you're going to get a broad QRS complex. Okay, so an antidromic AVRT, because the activation is coming from where the accessory pathway is plugging into the ventricle, in this, in this case, the right side, you're going to get this kind of very broad QRS complex when you have the antidromic, the, 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 the opposite circuit. So someone with an accessory pathway can potentially have both a narrow and a broad complex tachycardia, depending on the direction of the circuit, whether it's orthodromic or antidromic. Okay, that's another cause for a broad complex tachycardia. Now, you don't come across this a lot, and this is probably quite specialist knowledge, but it is worth seeing it. And um, in this case, the patient is one of my patients that I brought in to the cath lab, and we were able to induce all these different tachycardias. The same patient with a right sided pathway, this right sided accessory pathway. Right, next slide, please. Pre excited is another cause for a broad complex rhythm. That's why I want to show here. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to show you this to you briefly. So, patients with accessory pathways can also have this kind of ECG appearance. This is called pre excited AF. OK, um, next slide, please. And it basically happens if you have atrial fibrillation, so the top chamber is you know, fibrillating and you have sort of like the signals are bombarding both the node and the accessory pathway. So you can see that the QRS complex uh, varies uh, in its appearance. OK, next slide, please. So it looks fast, broad and irregular. They call, we call this a fast, broad and irregular rhythm. You know, this is not VF because it's actually there is still an organized rhythm behind it. OK, it's not torsad because it's not a twisting axis thing. It just beat by beat looks different because the fibrillatory waves, uh, the input to the accessory pathway and a node uh, differs beat by beat. So that's why the, the width differs beat by beat. But when you see this very, very typical pattern, you know, normally a patient will be quite unwell. And again, with any tachycardia where the patient's unwell, you DC cardio. Right. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is the final slide. Um, can anyone tell me what this shows? Treatment. I'll come to the treatment in a minute. I think people mean treatment for a uh, wolf pass and white. So patients with wolf pass and white and tachycardia, ultimately the treatment is catheter ablation. Uh, you know, if they are symptomatic with um, with a pre-excitation with full pass and white, uh, especially if they have got uh, you know very rapid rhythms, uh, evidence of you know definitely if they have pre-excited AF, then the treatment would be catheter ablation. Um, right. Uh, so this ECG, what do people think? Are we looking at the same ECG here? It is broad complex, yes. Good. This is not, it's not, I mean, someone wrote down, good for trying, but this is not VF, this one. AV block, okay. Uh, yeah, so the main thing I want to ask the question, I guess, is what's causing the broad complexes? What, what, what is the cause for the broad complexes? Yeah, that's right. It's a pace, this, this is a, there's evidence of pacing here. 
and this is what gives the broad complexes now. Uh, not all the beats are paced, so you can see there are some narrow beats there, okay? But you can see also pace beats. The pace beats are the broad one with the small, can you see a small little artifact, a small spike in front of some of the, in, in front of the, the QRS complex? You can, you sometimes cannot, in some patients, the, the spikes may be very small. You might not be able to see it, okay? So it's not always there, but if it's there, it's very helpful. But this is clearly, you can see a very clear pacing artifact. In fact, if you look at V3, V4, it's very clear. There's a very clear line, like an artifact, a uh, very sharp line in front of the complexes in V3, V4. Uh, you can also see in V5. If you look carefully, you probably can see it. It's not so obvious in um, the, 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 the limb leads, but it's quite obvious in the chest leads. Uh, so this is a pace rhythm. Uh, and all I want to show you really is that, um, uh, next slide, please. That, so in this case, you can see intermittent RV pacing. Okay, so there's some there's some some of the beats are not pace beats. Okay, so but I, it's just quite a nice slide because you can compare how it looks like with its the patient's own uh, conducted beats versus a pace beat. Okay, next slide. Okay, pace rhythm is another cause for a broad QRS complex. Next slide. So. Uh, Basically, broad learning points uh, around uh, broad complex rhythm, broad complex tachycardia. So the kind of mechanism that can give you a broad complex rhythm is either VT, and we went through it in some detail in that first um, first broad complex rhythm that we saw. Could be SVT with aberrancy, or so-called SVT with bundle branch block. Could be pre-excitation, or could be a pace rhythm. Now, most people will say VT until proven otherwise for good reasons. If you're not sure, you always assume the most you know potentially dangerous mechanism. Um, if the patient's unwell, cardiovert. Okay, with these patients, anyone with broad complex rhythm, you really should seek help early on. Even if the patient is relatively well, you want to refer early on because um, generally speaking, we're more worried about these rhythms. Okay, next slide. So this is the, what I was going to go. You remember right at the beginning, I mentioned about how to manage someone acutely. And I mentioned about a pathway, uh, an algorithm that we can use. So this is the actual slide that uh, I, I was referring to, which... I hope you've come across this. Um, this is uh, somewhat updated now. There has been a, a more recent Resuscitation Council uh, update um, in terms of uh, ALS guidance, but the gist of it remains the same. I think they've changed the formatting slightly, but the content is pretty much the same. Um, so if you go through, this is basically managing uh, someone acutely with a tachycardia and a pulse. So if you have someone with a tachycardia and a pulse, um, these are the way, this is the way that you manage it. Okay, you start off at the top, you do A, B, C, D, E management, obviously. Um, then you want to assess to see if the patient is unwell or not. So when we mean unwell, we mean, are there any adverse features, any signs of hypoperfusion, of shock? So shock, syncope, myocardial infarction, uh, sorry, myocardial ischemia and heart failure is listed as some of the things to look at. But clearly you can assess someone clinically yourself. The patient doesn't look well, look gray. You know, look cool, all those things. You want to try and decide, are they compromised or are they not? If they're compromised, really, we're talking about electricity, like you mentioned earlier with that patient with the broad complex rhythm, we will shock the patient, all right? If they are otherwise well, then you can assess a bit. So it comes down to whether or not we're dealing with a regular, sorry, we're dealing with a narrow complex or a broad complex rhythm. So case one or case two. Case one is the narrow. So if you go narrow, you go to the right side, the green bit. So we mentioned about vagal maneuver. If it's regular, obviously we're talking about SVT. So if you see narrow complex, is the rhythm regular? Yes. Then we're dealing with some kind of SVT. You do vagal maneuver, adenosine, and then you come and you see. If it interrupts it, then we're do talking about some kind of nodal dependent tachycardia. Okay. And then and then it goes and show how you can work it out. If it's irregular, sorry, and if it doesn't terminate, then we're talking about some kind of atrial tachycardia, some kind of atrial flutter. If it's irregular, then you're dealing with AF. Okay. Then on the left, broad complex rhythm, okay, then, you know, we generally see if it's regular or not. Are we dealing with VT or we're dealing with SVT with bundle branch block? If it's irregular, we need to think about is it AF with bundle branch block or could it be pre-excited AF? So these are all the things that we've talked about today. Okay. All right. I think we're going to stop there. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, in fact, one second. Do you mind just moving on the slide a bit? I think we might have some more. I might have some more. Okay. Don't worry about case three. We'll talk about it another day. 
Um, that's enough, I think, for today. All right. So, uh, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, apologies for the um, technical issues at the beginning. Uh, we've just swapped over to Microsoft Teams. So these are teething issues which we'll address. So next time when we do this, it'll be, it'll be much more uh, smoother. But thank you, and thank you, George, for moving the slides. Thank you, Dr. Ang, uh, and, and again, apologies for the technical difficulties today. Uh, could, could I just remind everyone uh, that we, we do have our survey, uh, and I would appreciate if, if we could complete it today uh, as soon as you receive it. Uh, it's just great for us to, to keep our records for feedback and to keep updating and ensuring a good quality program. So uh, yeah. thanks very much, everyone, and uh, you. we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nine. Bye-bye. Thanks, George. Bye. Thanks, Rich.